Good afternoon, this is The Ugly Truth coming to you live from Metro Hall here in Toronto. It is uh, Wednesday, June the 1st, 2011. Here to cover an uh, inquiry into uh, police actions and uh, planning for uh, events such as the G20 summit which uh, occurred here last summer. Let's uh, have a look inside. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll try and correct the spelling. <laughs> Mr. Modlick, and after Mr. Modlick, Mr. Modlick, hi. I live in downtown Toronto. I've done first some background. On September the 23rd, the Toronto Police Services Board launched this review to, exam to examine a number of matters relating to events both before and during the G20 summit, which was held in Toronto on June 25 to June 27, 2010. The terms of reference are concerned with the role of the board and the Toronto Police Service played in the planning leading up to and during the G20 summit. The question chosen by the review for today's public hearing, what role should civilian oversight play with respect to the policing of major events is an important one. The purpose of these public hearings is to give the public a forum to lend its voice to the discussion that is happening, to share their insights with us so that your views can be considered when Justice Morden analyzes the issues that the board is asking to consider. One very important thing, the review has asked that we not hear specific complaints about the police, and there's a very good reason for that. There is another body, the Office of the Independent Police Review Director, it is an independent body uh, that was set up by the Government of Ontario, and that is their jurisdiction. The first submission uh, from Julian Faulkner, please. Uh, uh, on my left is Lisa Walter. And uh, to her left is Jesse Rosenfeld. Uh, my comments are directed to the systemic issues for which, respectfully, I would suggest you uh, are mandated to look at. And I respect the issue about uh, references to individual police officers. And, uh, both Lisa and Jesse are aware of it. What has unfolded since July 22, 2010, and absolutely ensnared my client Adam Nobody, and what has unfolded most recently as reported on May 26, 2011, in respect of Dorian Barton, and what has unfolded in respect of the removal of badge numbers on police uniforms is a startling reality. The unseemly exercise of cat and mouse that we've seen uh, play itself out in the press as recently as May 26, is all an example of how individual police officers and their leaders have had to be chased, literally chased, through the media in order to ascertain their identity. And he quoted the materials as referring to a, quote, blue wall of silence. This case concerned the Toronto Police Service. The confluence of certain aspects of police culture and peer pressure found in segments of the police community which deters some officers from cooperating or being seen to cooperate with an investigation of a fellow officer's for fear of being ostracized by their peers. The notion of a blue wall of silence is not only theoretical, it has entirely played itself out in the post-G20 investigations and inquiries of what was easily one of the most disturbing and unseemly police cover-ups that this province has ever seen. There needs to be systemic change. There are many very good police officers in this city. There are many very good police officers in this province. They are done a disservice by this blue wall of silence. I urge you to make serious recommendations in this area. Thank you. My name is Lisa Walter, W-A-L-T-E-R. I was arrested on Sunday, June 27th at Bloor and St. Thomas when one of my journalist colleagues was arrested. I had press credentials. Police referred to them as fake and arrested me also. We were transported to the Eastern Avenue Detention Center where I was held for 13 hours and then released in the middle of the night without having been charged with any crime.
crime. I was, when I was arrested, uh, I was not informed of my rights. I endured a barrage of slurs based on the arresting officer's assumptions about my gender and sexual orientation. This barrage continued once I got to the Eastern Avenue Detention Center. The conditions at the center were crowded, there was inadequate food and water, it was extremely cold. Uh, hi there, my name is Jesse Rosenfeld, I was a journalist covering the uh, G20 uh, for a few outlets when I was arrested. Uh, my press credentials and pieces were also rejected and, not, uh, and seen as fake or somehow illegitimate, after which I, had been, uh, I was beaten and then hauled off to the uh, detention center at Eastern Avenue. This happened the day before, on the evening of the 26th, the Saturday night, when I was covering the demonstration at the Novotel Hotel when the police engaged in a mass arrest. Uh, when I was uh, taken in, I was uh, injured from the beating that I had taken. My ankle was swollen, uh, was sore on my ribs, uh, was limping a bit. Uh, the, con the conditions in terms of the treatment of the police, we were regularly, and we were organized, we were all making demands for water, for food, uh, for regular bathroom treatment, all of which were treated with systematic contempt by all officers that we deal with. Some would placate us and say, yeah, we're looking into it, while others would say things like, uh, what makes you think you deserve rights? He looked at me before pushing me through the gate and said, uh, whatever, I don't care. There you go, you fucking hippie. Go burn some cars. <laughs> My name is Tommy Taylor. My fiance, my fiance and I were arrested at the Toronto G20 summit. Uh, we weren't protesters, not that that should really matter. I witnessed abusive and disgusting behavior from Toronto officers, many without name badges. Civilian review, to me, that means the boss's review. That's who we are as civilians, to the police, bosses. The next question is what role should civilian oversight play? To me, that question is pointless if it refers to future events, if it means what can we do better next time. No. We determine the role civilian oversight will play right now by dealing with the police actions at the 2010 Toronto G20 Summit. I saw every squad of riot officers had their own video camera film, filming the civilians. Where is this footage? Will it be made available to you? I've seen Toronto police officials lie and say that only a maximum of 20 people were held in those cages for only a short time released the CCTV footage and audio from inside the detention center that shows 40 men handcuffed with a door without a porta potty, officers watching them to go to the bathroom in a cage for 24 hours, ran together, standing room only, screaming for water. Then to see the police leadership flat out lie about the conditions inside there infuriated me. I dared them to prove me a liar, released the footage from the detention center. He or someone he refuses to name ordered Toronto officers to stand down while Vandals smashed windows and set cars on fire. Then hours later arrested hundreds of peaceful civilians all over the city. This was either extreme cowardice, extreme stupidity, or done on purpose to justify the close to a billion dollar budget. These people do not deserve their jobs. They failed the people of Toronto and destroyed public trust of the police. And therefore they failed these police officers as well. Prove to Toronto that the police work for the people and can't be bought off with higher budgets, excessive overtime and new toys. Accountability and transparency of the events of G20 are the only way to pave a future for civilian oversight of policing. Hold the leadership accountable. To appear before you here tonight, we're very much appreciative of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Um, I'm here today to make submissions on behalf of the association, which, as you may know, has taken a very strong interest in the G20. We've published two reports dealing with G20 abuses, and we have been very active in calling for a public inquiry into the events of the G20. Uh, civilian oversight of these kind of issues should not be hindered by the traditional divide in policing between policy and operational decision making, and police boards should not shy away from asking police services to justify specific decisions, such as, again, large deployments or the use of specific equipment, such as long-range acoustical devices, rubber bullets, and the like, in relation to specific incidents and major events. The creation of an effective police audit mechanism would require giving independent civilian scrutineers the responsibility of monitoring and reporting on police policies, practices, and procedures on an ongoing basis. Auditors would require ongoing and unfettered access to police facilities, records, and personnel, and be charged with the responsibility of observing and reporting on how police conduct themselves, both in the major event context and beyond. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto. Uh, in a time when a lot of people are very eager to say, uh, I am not a protester, I will say, I am a protester. I have marched against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
I have marched against the prorogation of Parliament. I did not march during the G20. The police successfully deterred me from marching, and in a country which guarantees people the right to peacefully assemble, uh, I believe that the police announcements of water cannons, sound cannons, uh, rubber bullets, and other indiscriminate weapons which can target large groups of law-abiding people is a violation of the right to assemble peacefully. And yet, the practice on the streets of Toronto is completely different. And I'm going to show you a series of photographs here, and I'll give you copies of these photographs. These are all taken subsequent to the G20. This is at a protest in January of this year, a police officer without a name badge. The same protest, a different police officer, no name badge. In March of this year, a protest calling for police accountability, Officer Andrew Dobro, no name badge. There is a systemic problem with police officers following the orders of the Civilian Oversight Board, and that means that the chief, whose job it was to implement those orders, is disobeying orders. That is police misconduct. What do we do? Do we just sit around and ask questions like, next time, how are we going to make changes? Or do we use the powers that exist in the law right now to, make, uh, to, to hold people accountable? And now, if we go back to the Police Act, the Police Act says that a police board can hold the chief of police accountable. It can suspend the chief without pay, pending a hearing into his or her conduct. And massive charter violations are definitely misconduct. It can uh, hold a hearing. It can prosecute the chief. If the chief is found to be guilty of misconduct, it can fire the chief. And that is what we should be talking about. The people of Toronto have put you in a very important position. You are the upholder of the Charter right now. You are the, people, the person that the people are turning to to defend them. And we want you to do that. And we believe that you can do that. This review is not over. You have the opportunity to turn this into the proper investigation of police actions with firm consequences for those actions that we demand. And I've said the Toronto Police Board can do better we're looking at you to do better, sir. Uh, my name is Michael Kempa. I'm an associate professor of criminology at the University of Ottawa. What I'd like to do is to briefly discuss two very important sets of developments in modern Western policing uh, that raise very specific and important issues around the context of the future role of civilian oversight of policing around what we call so-called mega events. So in the longer term, this would require reform to the legislative structure for policing and its governance across the provinces of Canada. However, at a ground level and in a more immediate sense, a relatively straightforward means of addressing some of these problems uh, would be to engage citizens in the planning stages for the policing of major public events. My name is Casey Orr and I'm the chair of the Political Action Committee for Queer Ontario a provincial network of gender and sexually diverse individuals who are committed to questioning, challenging, and reforming the laws and institutional practices that regulate queer people. Aside from being a reprehensible violation of Section 10 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, such a practice is grossly discriminatory in the way it targeted individuals and subjected them to less humane treatment because of their disclosed or perceived sexual orientation. But, as we've already heard tonight, this was not an isolated incident. However, it does not do anything to correct the present. We cannot improve the future unless we correct the present. The present. the present has not been corrected. It has been, the protagonists of this fiasco have not been held accountable. They have not paid uh, any, any dues for punishment. They have been engaged in evasive maneuvers and the blame game among the services between the police and the SIU. I can only say we should start at present and continue to the future. Otherwise, it will be as if we're condoning what they have done and they can repeat it again next year or the year after, unless they are hold, held responsible and held accountable. Thank you. Um, are harassed by the cops, racially profiled, you know, thrown in the backseat of the car, you know, just because of the color of their skin. And it's not just blacks, it's also people, you know, that are probably from India, Pakistan. There's a lot of harassment done. And I feel for you guys, you know, people who, who have experienced this injustice by them, and it's within the system. 
Um, also, I believe that cops should uh, not overstep their boundaries. They should know, you know, where their place is and not think that they govern, you know, everyone by uh, overstepping their boundaries. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you. I just say, uh, Mehdi Patel, I'm with Canadians demanding a full public inquiry into the G20. We'll be having our concert, uh, charter rights, uh, celebration of our pluralistic democracy, June 25th at Queen's Park. And um, I'm afraid to say that it is a systemic problem with policing. And uh, there is a culture. It's going to take years to reform. This is the first step. Um, I can just say we all should join TPAC, Toronto Police Accountability Coalition. We need, we need to we need to take over our police force and uh, re remind the police force that it is a civilian body. As it is, it is the most undemocratic institution in Canada and it needs to change. Thank you. Some questions, questions which I hope you people will find answers to. So far, as far as I know, nobody has even asked them, let alone answered them. I want to know who gave the orders. I don't think it was Bill Blair. So I do think Bill Blair has, no doubt he thinks it's honorable, uh, uh, been covering up for whoever it was. Uh, a law that is passed in secret is illegal, as I think you know. People must be, at least in principle, able to find out about the law in order to be able to obey it. Who declared Queen's Park to be a free speech zone and then sent the cops in to arrest people? Who told the police to make themselves scarce when the vandalism started? What does the board do when its orders are disobeyed? What can the board do when its orders are disobeyed? By the River League, uh, of which I am not a member of the organization. However, you will grant me I am a material stakeholder because the police car that was left burning for two and, a, two and a half hours was not 10 meters from our property. If it had exploded, it is doubtful that the insurance would have paid any damages. And so you can understand, Chief Justice, my concern. People are indignant why bankers could be bailed out with public funds while we should be paying with our pension checks while money is squandered. Good evening, Your Honor. My name is Jeff Cohen, and I'm the owner of the legendary Horseshoe Tavern on the corner of Queens, China. Nobody has seems to be answering this question. I can't find it in the media. Anybody I've talked to, my BIA, my counselor, I managed to talk to the mayor, anybody like that. Nobody seems to be able to answer me. Why did the police stop the Saturday protest at a busy intersection like Queen and Spadina? First and foremost, Police authorities must be placed under strict civilian control with clearly independent review of police actions. This is not the case. We must abandon our current deference to police authorities, the assumption that gives the benefit of doubt to the police rather than the citizen. Based on our history over the years, our police leadership seems to have been able to intimidate and bully our civilian agencies, oversight agencies. I think that's what's going on. And frankly, I think that the, the real service you can give to the community basically is to, you know, call for a public inquiry into the whole affair. Uh, uh, my concern here is that higher levels of government are trying to avoid responsibility by deferring this issue down to this board, but this is the forum that we have. The issue is the orders that were given to police, and we need to know who gave those orders and uh, how we can hold the decision makers accountable. Article 2 of the Constitution states that everyone has fundamental freedoms, including freedom of peaceable assembly and freedom of association. These rights were systematically abrogated by a clearly implemented plan. And the important point is that internationally protected persons were not allowed to leave the security zone. So there was no security threat beyond line of sight from the security zone. Therefore, police had no business uh, being at Queen's Park in large numbers to attack protesters or at Allen Gardens or other areas far from the security zone. Now, I'm a taxpayer, I paid property taxes, and what we saw was a tremendous and unwarranted amount of taxpayers' money wasted on extra police officers far beyond any conceivable uh, threat that has ever been demonstrated at any previous international gathering or at any event in, in Canada. Even the vandals didn't hurt people. 
The only danger to public safety came from the police. And what I witnessed down there, the first thing I witnessed was I was under the Ontario Public Works Act. I was held under a false illegal law that was deemed illegal by the Ontario Ombudsman. It was a 1939 law that was used to protect against Nazi sabotage. They used that law on Canadians. They lied about a five meter rule that never existed. First it was outside the fence. Then it was inside the fence. Then it was all over the city. Illegal searches were happening all over the place. Our charter rights were violated on such a mass scale that we've